Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm so excited today uh, with today's webinar, um, The Future of Selling. Uh, it's proudly brought to you by Sales IQ. Uh, I'd just like to thank right at the outset our two sponsors. Uh, so my good friend, Chris Beal at Connect and Sell. Uh, they run an amazing platform. So uh, they run a sales acceleration platform uh, where its agents and its technology help you navigate gatekeepers, IVR systems, phone trees, voicemail, uh, to get decision makers on the phone for you. Uh, it allows you to have more conversations in 90 minutes uh, than you'd have in a week or maybe a month of normal conventional dialing. So I really encourage you to check out Connect and Sell. Uh, our other sponsor is Trigger, which is the leading platform in Asia Pacific as a sales intelligence platform. So it gives you email addresses, people's phone numbers, but more importantly, it gives you amazing insights into the companies you're targeting and automates the process of taking the attributes of your ideal customer profile and blending that with trigger events that create context and relevance for you and how you drive outreach and gives you lead funnels. So I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, sorry about the scary slide of uh, me being half cyborg. Um, let me just talk through what we're really going to cover today. Uh, what is the future of selling really? There's a whole lot of hype. Uh, but we're going to deal with two key questions. Could a sales bot really kill your sales career or can technology make you superhuman? Uh, in the last 12 months, I've had the privilege of co-authoring a book called Tech Powered Sales uh, with the legendary Justin Michael. Uh, that book uh, went live uh, around the world just in the last 48 hours. It's already hitting number one uh, in, in a number of markets. So we'll talk about that book at the end and also an opportunity for you to be able to do uh, a, a sales TQ technical quotient test uh, at the Salzburg's site for free. Um, but the reason this uh, webinar today and topic is so important is that the last 18 months has really been a catalyst for the acceleration of the fourth industrial revolution. We are absolutely today in a digital first world where every company is seeking to run channel shift programs where they move their customers and partners and even employees out of expensive human manual modes of engaging to automated omni-channel ways of engaging. The new differentiator is customer experience rather than, than salesmanship or saleswomanship. Um, so the thing that's important today is that everybody, uh, both companies, individuals, especially for salespeople, we all need to get a little cyborg. We need to work out how we can blend human and technology together to achieve new levels of effectiveness in what we're seeking to do. And the failure rates in business to business selling are staggering. You know, I commonly see organizations uh, that, that bring me in to help them where 70% or upwards of people are failing to hit their targets. We know that that inside sales role, people are typically only in that role for about 14 months and the failure rates in that role are very high. So what we're gonna to cover today is, is it really a utopian or dystopian style of future? Um, but the reality is, is that this industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution is like nothing else that's, that's actually gone before. We'll talk about the role of, of customer experience and humans and technology in the buying and selling process. Uh, some predictions uh, through the, the, the 2020s. Justin and I were bold enough to put 20 predictions in for the 2020s. We'll share five of those with you today. Um, and then how do you really elevate your technical quotient? How do you become more tech, tech savvy in your role? Whether you're in rev ops or sales ops, whether you're an inside sales person, or a field seller, an account exec, an AE, uh, or maybe you're a sales leader, how do you really develop your TQ? Just wanna also let you know today that it's being recorded uh, and what Julie, uh, our COO at Sales IQ and I are gonna to seek to do after this is we're going to add into this webinar recording the video clips that I'll be, I'll be referring to in the presentation, uh, just to really give you a sense of the jaw dropping level uh, of change that, that's actually going on in the world. Back in 2015, there are a bunch of predictions made by Forrester. Uh, these stats you can see on the screen are from Andy Hoare at Forrester at the time. Uh, and, that, and that magazine cover on the left, uh, I was on the, the front cover of a, a magazine at the time called Sales Mastery. 
Uh, I wrote this Monty Python black humor-esque article about the apocalyptic extinction of sellers, uh, but based on some of these stats. Uh, but back then, uh, Andy, based on research they did uh, with hundreds and hundreds of buyers, he really believed that about 22% of B2B sales roles would disappear by 2020. Uh, but where there was going to be carnage is where people were really just more transactional. They were just order takers. Those sellers that can manage to be truly consultative, they aspire to that trusted advisor role. Uh, they provide a whole lot of value in the insights that they provide. Those roles are going to grow, but basically all of the other roles are in trouble. And, and that category of explainer uh, that, that Andy coined is uh, really something where I would, I would call that tactical seller. It's the field BDM or AE that's, that's really slugging it out with the competition, helping the customer understand why our unique benefits or advantages should be the reason that they pick us. Uh, and that navigator is really the relationship manager. Uh, interestingly, in the same period, Gartner did a bunch of research uh, and they, they found obviously that there's a, a massively lower cost of transacting when you can do it uh, online and automate it. But uh, they believe that by 2020, 85% of interactions between, between businesses, now that's not the process of winning a new client, but the process of transacting between businesses, 85% of it will be automated. And I, I believe that that's pretty much true. I know for myself, when I win a very large client, they ask me to set myself up on their accounts payable portal to submit my own invoices. I, I don't get to deal with humans at all. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my own admin for them. Uh, and they're automating it all in the background on platforms like Ariba. Uh, so a lot of these predictions, I definitely believe the trends are true. No, no one's gone back and measured this. Now, Justin and I have made 20 predictions for the 2020s and it's going to be interesting in 2030 to come back and have a look but we've already seen some of the predictions about acquisitions already play out already play out so when i talk about the the level of disruption that's coming in b2b selling one of the common things i hear from people is that look i'm really immune from all of this you know i've got great relationships with my clients uh, a bot is never going to be able to provide real empathy um, relationships insulate me from this, you know, zombie uh, sales bot apocalypse that you talk about. Now, you know, I don't know whether you share that view yourself, that, you know, you'll be okay. You know, a bot could never do selling. Well, there's, there's lots of examples where bots are doing selling, which I'll share with you in a moment. But let me tell you a true story. I was speaking with a room full of CEOs about a month ago, uh, talking about these issues. Uh, and, and the fact that every seller needs to up their game to provide the level of value that actually funds them in their role. Uh, and in the break, one of the CEOs came to me. He, he ran the Asia Pacific region for a big North American uh, pharmacy company. Now, they, they are not a pharmaceutical manufacturer, but they provide compounding products and lots of other things that enable the pharmacist to make ointments, pastes, and drugs uh, within their own pharmacy. And uh, in the USA, uh, when COVID was going on in 2021, they, uh, they had a couple of their sellers resign uh, in key territories. And they had nobody in those territories for about four months. And they were looking at their dashboards in CRM and they noticed something really puzzling. They noticed that in these two territories that had no rep for four months, that revenue was continuing to grow, but interestingly, at higher margins than those territories that had historically, and at the highest margins across the company. And they thought, what's this? This is crazy. Now, this company was convinced that they needed reps in the field that visited uh, drug stores, they're called in the USA, chemist shops, they're called here in Australia where I'm from. But, but they were convinced that they needed reps to be calling at least twice a month uh, on these drug stores to maintain mind share, to make sure that they, they weren't losing market share. So they decided to go and visit the customers in those territories and have a conversation. And they said to the customers, hey, you know, we've noticed you, you know, you've, you've, you're transacting really strongly with us. We're really sorry that uh, we haven't replaced, you know, the rep that's been looking after you. Uh, we'd just love, love to have a conversation about that. And here's what they discovered. The customer regarded the rep visiting them as an interruption of their day and as someone and something that took them away from serving customers. 
And the, the company was just blown away. They said, but look, we invest a lot in these people for you. Sure, surely there's value. And I said, well, look, the things they tell me, I can read in your newsletter, I can receive in your emails. Um, there's really no value at all. Actually, other than probably one thing, they helped me get a discount. And this was the staggering thing. The only value in the eyes of the customer for these salespeople that were visiting them was that they helped them secure a discount. And when they weren't around to provide a discount anymore, the people kept buying. <laughs> they loved the service. They loved the experience. Uh, but they, they started buying without getting discounts and they were still happy. Now, here's what the company decided to do globally. Uh, the person that was speaking to me here in Australia, they said to him who was running the Australian business, they said, look, you know, you've, you've got three reps in Australia. Uh, there's a lower call frequency you're doing, but it's the same strategy. Uh, let's do an experiment and let's do an experiment that doesn't damage our core market in North America. So they redeployed, uh, to put it nicely, they redeployed those three field sellers uh, and they've been running without their field sellers for over a year and the business has never been stronger. And they've applied some of the money they were spending on those field sellers to the, to the inside sales function. It's really the technical people that answer queries uh, when, when the pharmacist actually calls up and has any issues or questions. Um, so they've managed to drive cost out of how they're going to market. But here's, but here's the lesson in all of this. If we as sellers don't provide the value that funds our role in the eyes of the customer and our employer, then there is no future for us. So relationships alone are not enough today. Now, there are environments where humans will thrive. We'll actually talk about that today. So there's a few things to be aware of. The first is that 70% of what sellers do today can be automated. Isn't that incredible? Uh, uh, if you think about what Connect and Sell does as a sponsor today and what Trigger does as a sponsor, you know, they, they can automate the outbound dialing process so you're not wasting time. You're just talking to a real prospect at the end of the phone. They give you all of that time back so you're actually selling. Um, if you look at what Trigger does, they feed you lead funnels and they contextualize the conversations you can have based on trigger events uh, and, and attributes. So you can show the person that you're calling that you really know them. So in my mind, the future of selling is when buyer sentiment meets seller relevance. And we then have human engagement at exactly the right time through the right, through the right channel. And it's empowered by technology. You know, Justin Michael often talks about the fact that the future of technology is when it all just melts away and we're not even conscious that it's there. Uh, it's just helping us have those high value interactions. Uh, that's really the key because what we're looking for is to be uh, through the right channel at the right time, having the right conversation with the right context. And if technology can really drive that for us and empower us to do it, if we could get in essence a virtual sales assistant that teed all that up for us, um, you know, then, then that'll transform selling. So again, you may feel that you're secure in your, in your profession and, and, and that a bot can't replace you. The information I'm going to share with you today, I think you'll understand that many people would laugh at that. Uh, there's industry after industry, profession after profession that's been impacted by technology. If you think about legal, accounting, audits, uh, you know, if you look at those functions, uh, if you think about mergers and acquisitions, you know, there was a time when there'd be an army of lawyers combing through all of the contracts of the company that's being acquired, you know, uh, and, and creating, uh, you know, all of, all of these risk registers and exception reports, you know, so the acquiring company could identify all the risks in making this acquisition. Well, now all of these gold contracts are electronic. They're fed through algorithms. All of the risks are automatically identified. Um, if you think about pathology, I'll share a story with you at the end about pathology, but pathology, radiology, pharmacy, even pilots, you know, there's, there's no more navigators in aircraft other than the A380s. And, you know, COVID's been, been a disaster for, for those super airliners. Uh, software can now write its own code. Um, just if you just think about this, I think about my relationship with my bank. I hardly ever walk into a bank. I hardly ever talk to anybody in the bank. And yet I love the experience that they give me. It's all been automated through apps and technology. So many professions, many professions are having their roles redefined and low value roles are going away. Now, when you think about this, rather than think about role replacement, think about task replacement. What are the tasks within your role that technology could do for you. That's one of the ways that we can future-proof ourselves. So let's just talk about the industrial revolutions. You know, the, the first one 
was when mills and looms and and steam engines really came along and it was the era of the Luddites, you know, that, that, that town in Europe where Ludd was their leader and they had a rebellion where they tried, rebellion where they tried to smash the, uh, the, the, the mills and looms. Um, you know, the next industrial revolution, the second one was, was the electricity and the phone and, and Henry Ford's, Ford's production line is where we saw huge um, masses of the population move from an agrarian existence into the cities where many of them lived like battery hens. Uh, and then the third industrial revolution really, really sparked by World War II and computing and electronics and communications, what we call ICT, information communications technology, um, really drove things. It was an incredible era. And, 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 and that was when Turing posited his question, you know, about could, could a computer pass a test where a human wouldn't even know that they were dealing with one on the other end of the keyboard. Um, we've now got to the stage where it's passed the Turing test on the phone. I'll talk about that. Um, and then the fourth industrial revolution that we're in now, we've been in it for about a decade, is where narrow AI, there's, there's another two types of AI I'll talk about, but you know, we've got the internet of things uh, with machine to machine uh, uh, communication where algorithms are constantly being improved. So narrow AI is really about task automation. Now, the next level of, uh, of automation where we go from narrow AI to general AI, uh, you know, is where there'll be huge carnage in jobs. Uh, and this is where, where technology does get a level of, of, of intelligence and it can contextualize across domains far more strongly. And then people, people wonder about the thing called the singularity, you know, will AI ever become self-aware? Um, and that's, that's certainly, certainly a big debate. Um, there's been some great books that I've read about that. Uh, so we, we won't, we won't d dive down that rabbit hole now. So let's really think about the intelligence revolution. You know, it was 25 years ago, if you can believe this, quarter of a century ago, that a computer beat Gary Kasparov at chess. Now that was really just brute strength what if analysis with computing. It was 10 years ago that IBM Watson won Jeopardy. Uh, and that was really amazing. Um, if, you, if, if you think about Jeopardy, that's, that's a really obscure natural language, uh, abstract contextualization game. Uh, it's really tough. And at the time that IBM Watson won Jeopardy, it was not connected to the internet, but it was the size of about a bedroom. Now, now Watson uh, is the size uh, of a big pizza box. So it's amazing how technology moves on. And it was about five years ago that Google's DeepMind uh, AlphaGo beat Lisa Dahl. Now, Lisa Dahl was the 18 times world champion at Go. Uh, and Go is an amazing game. We'll actually talk about that. But there's more potential options in the game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. Can you believe that? I can't even get my mind around that. And there's a thing called move 37 in one of the games where AlphaGo made a move where there was only a one in 10,000 chance that a human would have done that move. It's, it started to self-teach itself the game uh, and it's now completely, completely unbeatable. That game is two and a half thousand years old. It's amazing. And it was just about three years ago uh, that Google revealed Google Duplex uh, on stage and it was breathtaking. Uh, and they showed uh, a recording of a live call of Google Duplex. So, so, so that's their voice AI. And you can pick any accent or nationality or gender that you want. And it was phoning up humans and making appointments in really tough, complex environments without any problems at all. Uh, it even has ums and ahs uh, in, the, in the way that it's speaking and pauses. Uh, it uses the local vernacular in, in, in the way that it speaks, but it passed the Turing test. The people on the other end of the phone had no idea. Uh, and that technology, for example, example could be deployed as a, as a virtual sales assistant to call up and confirm meetings for you, for example. Um, but, but it was absolutely incredible. Now, interestingly, the technology went super quiet once they announced it. And there's been amazing things going on in the background that we don't know about. So again, are some roles immune? You know, if you think about the role of a fighter pilot, you know, I can't imagine anything more stressful, complex, you know, where you need split second human decision-making, where you need creativity in the way that you fly in a dogfight. Now, 
I can't wait to see uh, Top Gun. Top Gun's going to be an incredible movie. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the clips are just absolutely amazing. But the reality is uh, no human being can pull harder on that joystick than a bot. Humans pass out when there's a certain number of G-forces applied to their body. And in a dogfight, it's the aircraft's ability to turn harder and faster inside the other aircraft that gives it the chance to shoot it down, let alone the concepts of swarm technology and being able to multitask dealing with incoming threats uh, at an insane level of complexity. So, you know, it's really evolved. Now, you may not know this, but it was only about 18 months ago, uh, DARPA, which is uh, it's an acronym for the US, uh, the, the American Spook Agency that develops all its amazing cutting edge technology, uh, DARPA did a simulated dogfight with their AI fighter pilot and an F-16, real human F-16 pilot, and the DARPA AI pilot won five zip. It was no contest. And that was despite the DARPA AI pilot being detuned to, to fly well within human limits. It was just incredible. Uh, if you want to, you, you, know, you can have a look on, online uh, at Boston Dynamics. The Boston Dynamics computers are, are, are bots are absolutely amazing. Uh, they can do somersaults, they can run, they can jump up uh, on high, high boxes and walls. If you look at the way that Amazon works, if you have a look at Google Duplex, um, the, the, the way that that's operated. Uh, so we'll insert some of those videos in these recordings for you to have a look at. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Go happening out here. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Today, um, tonight? Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually we leave here for like upper like five people. For few, four people you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For, when tomorrow or weekday or for next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Bye bye. A 
dealt with a whole lot of abstract conversation where the person didn't quite understand uh, and had no, no issue at all. Uh, this is a screenshot of the example with, with AlphaGo. Uh, again, a game that's 250 years old, more options than there are atoms in the universe uh, where itself taught itself. Go is the world's oldest continuously played board game. It is one of the simplest and also most abstract. Beating a professional player at Go is a long-standing challenge of artificial intelligence. Everything we've ever tried in AI just falls over when you try the game of Go. The number of possible configurations of the board is more than the number of atoms in the universe. AlphaGo found a way to learn how to play Go. So far, AlphaGo has beaten every challenge we've given it, but we won't know its true strength until we play somebody who is at the top of the world, like Lisa Dong. A match like no other is about to get underway in South Korea. They said all is to go what Roger Federer is to tennis. Just the very thought of a machine playing a human is inherently intriguing. The place is a madhouse. Welcome to the Deep Mind Challenge. The whole world is watching. Can Lee Sedol find AlphaGo's weakness? Ooh. Whoa. Oh, is there, in fact, a weakness? The game kind of turned on its axis. Well, look at his face. That is not a confident face. It's developing into a very, very dangerous fight. Ooh, hold the phone. Lee has left the room. In the end, it is about pride. I, I think there's something went wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's made a mistake. He's got to pronounce a miracle. These ideas that are driving AlphaGo are going to drive our future. This is it, folks. Now, all of these technologies can be applied to what we do in selling, believe it or not. Um, this is a screenshot of the example of IBM Watson beating um, uh, ch previous champions, um, you know, within this amazing, amazing game. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. What do you say we play Jeopardy? All right, Let's all right. get right into the Jeopardy round. These categories, a man, a plane, a canal, Erie, Chicks Dig Me, children's book titles, My Michelle, MC5, and finally, vocabulary. Ken, you're in the first position. Please make a selection. Oh, I've never said this on TV. Chicks dig me for 200, please, Jimmy. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson. Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Same category, 600. At the Old Dubai Gorge in 1959, she and Hubby Lewis found a 1.75 million year old Australopithecus Boise-eyed skull. Watson? Who is Mary Leakey? You're right. 800, same category. Harriet Boyd Haas was the first woman to discover and excavate a Minoan settlement on this island. Watson? What is Crete? Yes. Let's finish Chicks Dig Me. So, first rule is to protect our careers is we don't want to compete where we cannot win. <laughs> it's really important to not build your career based on doing things that can be automated away. For example, if I was, was going to want to work as an accountant, I, wouldn't, I would not work in accounts payable processing. It's all been automated. I would not want to build my skills around account reconciliations. It's all been automated. If I was a lawyer, right, I wouldn't want to build it around, you know, doing contract due diligence. It's already been automated. So it's really important that we think about this. And this list that you can see on screen, all of these things can be done better by the bots, by algorithms and technology than humans. Now, you might raise your eyebrows at the last one here, detect honesty and emulate empathy. Now, notice I said emulate. <laughs> Uh, a bot will never have genuine empathy, but, but a computer can tell whether someone's telling the truth better than a human already today. So there'll never be real empathy, but it can certainly detect honesty. Uh, and, and there's an amazing example of a New Zealand company called Soul Machines. Uh, and again, we'll provide the links and in the recording, we'll try and provide the video as well. Uh, the Soul Machines, uh, about four years ago at a conference, uh, they had the presenter on stage walk up to a, to a computer screen 
and you can see the screenshot of it here. So this is Rachel, their AI salesperson, and the person's on stage looking at their laptop in the black and white thumbnail you can see there, and he's talking to Rachel uh, about buying a credit card. And Rachel goes through all of the discovery questions about what credit card would be best for him, and then figures out exactly which one is best, you know, based on his credit score, based on the type of card that he wants for points, based on the fact he pays down his balance every month to zero. Uh, it's a bit hard to see, but above his thumbnail, you can see those lines above there. Uh, through the laptop camera, Rachel, with her AI, uh, is analyzing his body language, his facial expressions, his intonation of voice. So when he says, really? She knows whether that's a skeptical really, and I'm interested really, <laughs> and she knows exactly how to respond. Good morning. Hi there. I'm Rachel. Hi, Rachel. I'm Sean's new. How's it going? I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time in New York City. Really? Where are you from? Um, have you ever heard of a place called the Internet? <laughs> yeah, I guess I spent some time there. Well, I've lived there all my life. I'm a creation of soul machines. I can see you and hear you. And what makes me different is that I can respond to your emotions. I guess you could say I'm putting a human face on artificial intelligence. Wow. So what brings you here? I am working with IBM Watson to deliver knowledge across a vast range of topics. My current interest is helping people find the best credit card for them. Really? I've actually been looking into credit cards recently. What a coincidence. Really? Yeah, but it's really overwhelming. You know, there's so many credit cards out there, so many offers, options. I don't really know what to do. Oh, Shantanu, I completely understand. It can be a lot to figure out. Would you like some help? Sure. Um, I'm looking for a card with no annual fee, a low APR, and something where I can get the maximum amount of points. OK. So you're looking for a points card. I can definitely help. Is this for personal or business use? Uh, personal use. And will it be your first card? Uh, no, I actually have a few. OK. Do you mind if I ask about your credit score? An estimate could help me narrow down the options for you. Uh, well, I'm at this audience, but it's 750. Just keep it between you and me. Excellent. You will have some good options. Since you said you're looking for a low APR, does that mean you typically carry a balance or that you pay it off every month? I really try to pay it off every month. All right. I have the perfect card in mind for you. It has no annual fee, an APR of 6.5%, and it comes with triple points on all purchases. Oh. How does that sound? Mm, sounds nice. How do I get started? Wonderful. I can transfer you to an agent to complete the application. Would you like to do that now? Yes, please. Before I do, is there anything else I can help you with, Shantanu? No, you've been great. Thanks so much. I'm so glad to hear that. If you know of anyone else who needs help with this stuff, feel free to send them my way. Have a great day. You too. Goodbye. So, uh, is B2B selling really more complex than being a fighter pilot? Because we know in B2C selling, if we look at, for example, the way that we buy music, the way that we can buy a lot of things on Amazon, uh, the, the way that we would buy movies. There's, there's lots of things. The last two motor cars, the motor vehicles that I've purchased, the first time I talked to a seller was when they called me for my credit card details. Uh, I wasn't interested in being put through the car sales process. It, it makes me feel dirty when I go and buy a new car. You know, I think, was I too hard on them? Did I get ripped off? I just always tend to have, you know, uh, buyer's remorse when I buy a new car. So I just decided I'm going to run the whole process online. Very disempowering for the seller, uh, but it's actually what's happening. Many of the car retailers around the world are taking control of the distribution channel themselves 
uh, to adopt Tesla like models. So, you know, is selling really more complex than all of these things that you can see? Well, there's, there's maybe some aspects of it are, but there's much of it that just is not. So there's a few things to really be aware of. Um, the first thing is there's, there's the business reality that despite, you know, all of, of the glossy brochures and the beautiful things on companies' websites about their altruistic values, um, you know, the fact that they're inclusive and they value diversity and they want to do good in the world, uh, which, which is great. You know, everybody has those aspirations, but there's these brutal economic realities that sit underneath this. All of these things need to be funded. There's economic realities. Every person in a company has to fund their economic existence. And as an employee, uh, we, we're regarded as a unit of production uh, and a customer is a unit of consumption. So, you know, these economics are brutal, but companies are thinking, do you know what? There's a once in a generation opportunity for us as leaders right now, once in a lifetime chance for us to drive change that we'd previously never even imagined might be possible. Do you know what? Right now, regulators, our bank, the unions, employees, our customers, everybody accepts that there needs to be dramatic change in how we all engage together. Um, uh, the people financing our business are giving us some runway to go and drive these transformations. But we can move people into digital channels for engagement that do two things simultaneously. They drive down the cost to serve while also driving up the experience that that person has. We can make it better and easier and also lower cost. Uh, and now companies with the right level of capital the same as the new rules of war, the company, the, not companies, the countries with the most money and most advanced technology are going to be winning these wars. Uh, and now it's the same with companies in the commercial sector. Applying capital to creating great digital experiences is what makes all of the difference. Um, so again, the lowest cost to acquire and the lowest cost to serve, and how do we create great customer experience for loyalty as opposed to just this magic of a salesperson. Most, most leaders regard their sales machine as kind of this mystery black box that delivers, delivers variable results, um, right? They're really looking to get a more predictable business model in place. So, so capital is absolutely replacing humans. And as scary as this sounds for most of us that are watching this right now, right now, there's a well-funded software engineer that's working hard to figure out how to replace what we do. It's just the reality. So we need to stay one step ahead, one step ahead. Now, just as an example of this, um, you know, when, when I catch Ubers, I often talk to the drivers and, you know, I found that drivers that have been uh, looking after me have been flight engineers, uh, A380 pilots, pathologists, m and lawyers, computer programmers uh, that, just, that just couldn't get work. Um, and that wasn't due to COVID, it's this trend that's been going on, just, just fewer roles. Uh, a lot of roles in markets like Australia, where you know, it's a very expensive labor market, have been offshored to places like the Philippines and India, where there's, where there's a lower cost of labor. But again, those roles will eventually get lost to technology. So what happens with technology, and if you think about the taxi industry, is initially what technology does is it augments the way that people works and it makes it better. So if you think about the taxi industry, you know, all of a sudden they had radio dispatch, you know, uh, then, then they had navigation, then they had the ability to, to take automated payments rather than manual payments, right? Now, so the technology augmented, it was the same with aviation. You know, the technology was automating until eventually it automated things and replaced people. So there was no need for a flight engineer on the flight deck of an aircraft anymore because computers are doing all of that work. Uh, and the same with taxis, you know, where taxis will get to is they won't even need the drivers. All they'll need is someone that's willing to provide the capital to do the, um, go the Google self-driving car. So again, technology augments what we do. Think about the roles that, 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 that we, can, we can augment and replace tasks rather than our actual entire job. Right, so we focus on automation, but be aware that ultimately we, we can be replaced if we're not careful. So we need to engineer our career so that that doesn't happen to us. 
So harness the power of technology and combine it with human strengths. That really is the key. So big key thought here, I'm gonna say it again. Think about task automation instead of role replacement. I'll give you an example of cardiologist versus radiologist. Um, now, this is a personal story. Um, about two and a half years ago, I, I do a lot of cycling. I'm one of those annoying Lycra coated speed impediments uh, on the road as a driver. I do a lot of cycling in Sydney. I live in sort of God's country for riding on the northern beaches of Sydney where there's national parks. And despite riding more and more and losing weight, you'd think I'd be getting fitter. There was a common climb I did and I was getting slower. Um, I just wasn't able to go faster up this climb. And most men especially are really bad at listening to their bodies, but I decided to go and get checked out. Um, and he, here's the interesting thing. It's, it's the things that, that we don't notice. It's the habits in our lives that create things that don't seem like they make a difference today or tomorrow, but the cumulative effect of these then has a tipping point. Um, you know, and it can be the end of our job or our career. In my case, it could have been the end of my life. It could have been the end of my life. And there's a, there's a parallel here with technology. So I had a contrast dye CT scan of my heart using amazing tech. And they sent those images off. They sent those images off to uh, a radiologist, two radiologists, in fact, expert radiologists that analyzed the images. And they wrote up this report. So I was 56 at the time. And it said I had a cardiological age of 84, amazing. And that I had a 50 to 70% blockage uh, in a part of the heart they call the widow maker. Uh, you hear about healthy people that just seem to drop dead and they get no signs of a problem before that, no chest pain. That's because the problem was in the widow maker part of the heart. Now, the interesting thing was, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the long story, just jump to the end. Um, I'm, on, I'm on the operating table awake um, watching my cardiologist uh, navigate uh, up an artery in my arm with a camera to actually have a look and investigate. And he ended up stenting me. So I'm watching this whole procedure. Uh, and just all of a sudden, I'm on the operating table and I just, I just feel better. I feel, I feel bit better blood flow. Uh, when my wife saw me in post-op, she said, man, you've got color back in your face. You look great. Here's what he said to me. He said, um, that report wasn't actually accurate. You were 99% blocked and a hair's breadth away from dead. Um, so this is the interesting analogy here. Um, had technology analyzed, analyzed those images, it would have done a better job. Now, I could have easily dropped dead because in between getting that report and then being on the operating table, I went and did the holiday of a lifetime through Europe for seven weeks with my family. So I'm trudging around, you know, France and Italy, up three flights of stairs, big heavy bags, through Pompeii in 40 degree, you know, nearly 100 degree heat for, for, uh, for those in the States, um, sweating like crazy. I could have dropped dead in Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, that would have been down, you know, largely the fact that I didn't have the urgency to go in and get stented. You know, and here's the reality, you know, a, a bot versus a radiologist. You know, which one is 30 times faster and has 99% accuracy? It's the bot. It's not the human. So, you know, the future for radiologists and pathologists is actually not very good. They're going to be replaced by imaging and algorithms. Uh, now, if you're a cardiologist, if you're the person that actually does the stenting, you know, then you definitely have a positive future. And by the way, this is the, the pre and post images. You can see my arteries around my heart are all shriveled up on the left and they're all extended and healthy after I've been stented on the right. So for, you know, if, if you are like me, I used to feel like I aged a year of my life at the end of every quarter uh, as, a, as a sales leader, you know, running big teams. I've run the, the uh, Asia Pacific region for big North American companies. Um, but you've got to look after yourself. But, you know, just, just really think, you know, technology can save us. And the reality is, in this domain, there's better outcomes for patients. It's lower cost. There's much better outcomes. There's higher throughput and productivity for the businesses that use that technology. But there are some winners and losers. Um, now, uh, you know, this, this is, is, is amazing technology here. Um, uh, and th this is the first ever robotic um, catheter insertion. So this was the procedure I had. And this is where you can get, you know, the best cardiologist available in a big city 
providing this procedure in a small country town somewhere, or maybe in Africa uh, or, or in a third world country. So technology can deliver amazing benefits, but the reality for the, for the, um, for the cardiologist is they need to embrace technology and develop new skill sets. For the radiologist, there will be radiologists that are still doing images, but it'll be much fewer of them. They'll need to become very, very specialized. Uh, and this was actually Siemens, who's actually a market leader that provided this image for me. Uh, uh, they're actually one of my clients. So let's, so let's jump into um, what do we do about all of this? I think we can see that these trends are real. So these were the top five uh, predictions for B2B outbound. Uh, Justin and I made 20. This is really my, my, my top five pick. So I think, you know, right now there's going to be the rise of revenue operations that bring sales, marketing and omni-channel customer experience together, right? Finally bringing sales, marketing, and then all the subsets of sales, inside and outside sales, sales operations, bringing it all together, uh, starting to use technology like sales engagement platforms, which is a new category uh, of technology. So basically it enables you to design and execute your sequences uh, of outbound. So phone, voice, phone, email, text message, LinkedIn. Now, not all of it can be automated, but it builds you your online playbook for how you do your sequences. You load all of your messaging in. Uh, it helps with the cadencing. So basically the rhythm, the spacing at which you drive these sequences out to people. Uh, and the holy grail of, of sales engagement platforms, that's what SEP stands for, sales engagement platform. The holy grail of this is, uh, is basically a thing called liquid syntax, which is a way of injecting personalization. So going and finding relevant attributes about the person you're running outreach to uh, and making sure that you show them that you know them, that you're relevant to them, uh, uh, because that's incredibly important. Buyers today, uh, are getting bombarded and they expect us uh, to make sure that we're relevant to them when we drive outreach. So the rise of RevOps, the rise of sales engagement platforms. Uh, and then this one uh, is, is, is pretty out there. Uh, SDR X Machina will happen by 2025. It really will. Um, Justin Michael, the co-author of Tech Powered Sales, uh, was basically the the brain that a company tried to model this on and they had to go building it and came relatively close. Uh, they had amazing success and were acquired. Um, but that's why Justin has such incredible insights into what's going on with this area of automation. Uh, but the ability for a bot to run outreach and it passes the Turing test and create a qualified lead or to get a person to then become inbound and self-serve, purchase and onboard themselves, all of the text here, it just has to get refined. Um, and it's much closer than we think. You know, we know with Amara's law that, you know, we tend to overestimate what technology will do in the short term and we underestimate the power of it in the long term. Uh, but this one's very real uh, and that has big implications on sales roles. Uh, based on a lot of this, you know, there'll be 33% less field sellers. And I just challenge everybody based on that story I shared earlier. Don't delude yourself into thinking, well, you know, but I build relationships. Well, a relationship's the thing that people really want. I know for myself, I've got 21 and a half thousand unread emails in my inbox. I've got 340,000 followers in LinkedIn. I drown. I, I just drown in people contacting me, wanting, wanting things, trying to sell to me. You know, I don't want another relationship in my life with a seller. I just don't. I want re relationships with my inner circle, of uh, my family and friends, and, and some of my very close friends in business. So we, we can't just depend on a relationship. Um, and the other thing, the big trend is going to be uh, digital virtual assistants becoming real. And I'll talk about what that could look like. And in, in the book, we've, we've got a chapter in the book called A Day in the Future. <laughs> uh, and it talks about how this could potentially work for somebody. And the punchline in the story in the book is that everything you just read is actually here today. What's not here today is the orchestration of all of those pieces. Um, so 
let's talk about Steve, Sales Team Enablement Virtual Entity. Uh, it's an acronym that I made up, um, but let, let's think about what your sales virtual assistant could potentially do. And this is the thing that would give you back time. Uh, it could absolutely be creating lists of people for you to be targeting based on your ideal customer profile and triggers. Uh, and there's tech out there that does that today, that there's this company called trigger.ai. Uh, if you think about things like Sales Navigator uh, and LinkedIn Insights, which is a new product that they've launched, you know, those things can help you, uh, if you, if you know your ICP, can help you create lists of people you should be targeting. Um, referrals and personalization. Uh, that's absolutely something that can be automated. In that example of Rachel that sells the credit card live on stage, at the end of it, she asks for a referral. Uh, it's amazing how many sellers actually forget to do that. Uh, it can author and send emails. Now, Justin Michael shared this with me last week. Um, this email here, and it's we've obviously uh, uh, hidden the, the individual person's name, but, you know, hey, Mike, your profile looks very impressive. It's great that you've given back to the community along with your professional achievements, like volunteering at Rock Up and Sing Choir, um, would love to connect. That email was generated by a bot. Um, now, this is a, a very controversial thing to let you know, uh, and LinkedIn are always trying to block them, and it's against their, their policies, uh, but there absolutely are automated bots inside environments like LinkedIn. Uh, there's automated bots everywhere, uh, uh, and there's, there's technology GPT-3, for example, is a technology that can author emails, it can write poetry and songs. It's incredible where all this technology is going. The scary thing is so many sellers just can't seem to write. Um, so again, you know, if you want to future-proof your career in a digital world, I'd, I'd learn how to become a really good creative writer. Uh, we've got this technology that can dial and screen pop. And you know, we talked about Connect and Sell being able to do that for you for live calls. We've got technology that can, that can watch a call. A lot of the meetings today you know, are, are like this, they're on the end of a computer. I you know a long time ago, there was there was all of the furor around, you know, Google Glass, you could wear these geeky glasses that had cameras in them and a little display. Well, who needs that now that most meetings are online anyway, there'll be another screen beside your main screen with your AI virtual assistant, you know, prompting you about, about talk time, buying signals, the best reference customers to mention based on how the conversation's unfolding. Right, so already their technology is here to, that they can actually do that. There's, there's coaching software. Uh, it can coordinate and schedule your calendar. It can phone people up and confirm the meetings. Um, uh, it can prompt you on risk and next best action. If you look at, for example, Einstein within Salesforce as a CRM system, it can prompt on next actions. It can do the forecasting for you. Um, it, you know, we can automate so much of what we do. Uh, so all of this is coming. And what we need to do is figure out how do I create my own mashup of technology? Harvard Technology defined TQ, technical quotient, which is what we all need to develop, is this, our ability to assimilate and adapt technology changes by developing and employing strategies to successfully include tech in our work and life. That's really what it's about. How do we embrace and assimilate technology into what we're doing? Now, We've always known that you need to have reasonably strong IQ to be successful in anything in life, including sales. In sales, you need to have very high EQ, emotional quotient. You need to know yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, how to read others, how to navigate politics. It's been very important with EQ. But we need to add to that today, TQ, technical quotient. You need to know how to leverage technology to be able to drive the level of productivity and effectiveness for you to be successful. So here's the tips on what to do about all of this. Here's what to do. The first is don't depend on being valued on what can be automated away. Don't bank on you keeping your job based on doing tasks that a bot could do. The other thing is don't depend on what is not valued. A lot of sellers live in a deluded existence, thinking that people love the fact that they have a relationship with the seller. Buyers are not lonely and bored looking for another friend in the sales world. Um, they're just not. They're busy and stressed. If they can get things done more efficiently with less hassle and less risk, then that's what they'll do. 
So the relationships need to provide value beyond the relationship in of itself. Uh, and that's why us having insights is so important. Don't just be a transactor of a perceived commodity where you're the relationship for getting that done because they are the roles that are going away first. Become a super cyborg in, in, in how you actually operate. And here's how we do it. Here's how we do it. This is kind of the sort of money slide. This is an illustration out of the book. So again, we need IQ and EQ plus TQ, but we also need a platform. So next, in a moment, I'll talk about what that platform looks like to become a sales board. Uh, so the first thing to recognize is that these are the things that machines do well, filtering big data, monitoring for trigger events, all of that what if uh, analysis and then, and then pattern matching and recommendations, AI task automation, uh, information analysis, they do all of that well. But here's the list of what humans do well, and you'll be okay in sales. You'll have an amazing future if you can make your role all about these things in a way that creates value for the customer. So, you know, we humans are uniquely great at storytelling with fun and humor. Selling is fundamentally about the transference of belief uh, and instilling trust. Trust is, 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 both, is both binary and an X factor in selling. It's binary in that if there is no trust, nothing will happen. And it's an X factor in that the level of trust determines how fast somebody will move with us and the degree of commitments. And humans are really good at building trust. Now, companies try and build trust in a brand, right? But we want to build trust in the way that we operate as a person. Now, humans are much better at managing ambiguity, real empathy and insight, um, establishing a vision for a brighter future with the customer, and then helping them build the underlying business case that funds that change, and then securing consensus within their team, man managing all of the politics, knowing what's in it for all of the individuals, all of the individuals. And that's where, you know, having real curiosity, applying our own imagination and creativity, you know, all of these things together are what really future proof us as a seller. So what this means is you need to look for a sales career where there is ambiguity, there's complexity, there's a need to build a business case, there's lots of politics in play, uh, there's lots of competition, uh, that the customer uh, needs to, to sort of set a vision for what they could be doing in the future. Um, you know, you almost need to be a little bit of an evangelist and then an engineer. Um, as well as a politician, as well as a, a counselor. You know, all, all of these human skills coming together are what will future-proof your career. And then you outsource to the bots, to, to your, your virtual EA, to the tech stack, uh, those things that, that, that they can actually do better. So in the book, you know, some of the feedback we've had from the book, which has just been amazing, it's, uh, it's already shot up to number one on a whole lot of categories in just 48 hours since being released. But we talk about the, the essential stack and then the optional stack. Now, at the moment, for a, for a tech startup kind of company that's scaling up, they'll be spending about $1,000 per rep per, per month um, on, on tech. Uh, and that's going to $2,000 right now. We believe ultimately by the end of the decade, it'll be $5,000 per month per rep. But this is the essential stack. You need to have CRM with marketing. So, um, Sales cloud, marketing cloud, for example, if you're a Salesforce customer, um, but, but you need that to be able to create, create customer experience. So, so your CRM platform, you know, with marketing automation, you then need the social and networked intelligent pieces, things like LinkedIn Sales Navigator. You absolutely need today, if you want to drive outreach at scale, uh, you need a sales engagement platform, this new SEP category for, for, for designing your cadence and sequences uh, and getting all of that loaded in with automation that adds personalization in its early days, but it's getting very good. Uh, you then need all these data enrichment tools. You need to be able to find mobile phone numbers, email addresses, um, monitor for trigger events. You know, trigger events create context for conversations. It's, it's where the buyer journey and the seller journey have an inflection point with the highest probability of getting something done together. Um, these parallel assisted dialers, things like Connect and Sell, 
Uh, and then obviously things like Zoom that we're on today, we need the collaboration and engagement pieces. Uh, obviously you need your mobile phone, multifunction device that's in your pocket as well, right? But that's the essential stack. Now the optional stack, you know, is long, it's in, in the book and detailed and I won't go through this list, but this is the, you know, part of the bewildering array. Uh, you know, there's more than a thousand tech vendors out there, you know, that you as a company could be working with, a bewildering array. You need a trusted guide to figure all of this out. The Tech Powered Sales Book will help you understand this. And this is one of the key roles, obviously, of RevOps. So in the book, you can understand all of these different categories. Um, so uh, Tech Powered Sales is out 48 hours ago. Uh, it's, it's hit number one bestseller uh, in some markets. It's uh, three of the top 10 positions in new releases. I uh, really encourage you to buy the book. Uh, and I've just got uh, an incredible free offer for you. And I sound like the guy on TV selling on the advertising channel. Uh, but there's an opportunity for you at no cost to go and test your, your sales TQ, your technical quotient for selling. Um, now, it, th this is a checklist again out of the book, but you know, just ask yourself these things. You know, have you got Google Alerts running? Do you know how to construct a really strong Boolean search? Have you automated the monitoring of trigger events? Um, have you got safe searches running in Navigator? You can read this list on the screen. If you're not doing all of these things, then you're not operating at the level that, that, that you need to be as a seller. You're not using technology to give you a competitive advantage and just really encourage you to think about that. Um, so if you go to salesborgs.ai, uh, it's a community founded by Justin Michael, the co-author of the book. Um, and Justin and, I, Justin and I are very different people. Uh, this book, Tech Powered Sales, could never have been written by me alone or by him alone. Uh, but what we've managed to do is, is, is to bring old school and new school together, um, amazing ethical hacks of technology, of creating mashups, finding ways to break through, but done completely ethically uh, and in a way that will enhance your brand and not damage it. Um, so, so the book is really unique. Uh, no book has ever been published that details the um, sequences in case studies. So we've got case study examples exactly of how to build all of these sequences. Uh, that, that's actually gone behind the curtain to reveal all of this uh, stuff that's going on in the background. So really encourage you uh, to go to salesborgs.ai uh, and, and you can test your TQ. Be really interesting. And it, it works the same way as an IQ score. And you can see how you compare with others. So I want to really thank you for actually being on, on, on the webinar today. You can find me at tonyhughes.com.au, uh, uh, buy the Tech Powered Sales book. You can also find me at salesiqglobal.com. Uh, and we've also got a free offer from Sales IQ. You can do the Selling During Tough Times course for free. It'll give you some free tools you can download to reverse engineer your own metrics to create a sales success plan uh, for you in your own role. Uh, so that e-learning module on those tools are also free. We'll send that out in, in an email link with this as well. Uh, so with that, we might actually wrap up. So uh, again, thank you for joining the webinar today. Uh, and I'll see you online uh, and enjoy the Tech Powered Sales book. Thanks, everybody.